<laughs> so throughout the lecture this afternoon, um, we're, there are going to be some little characters appearing, OK? Um, some of you might be thinking, why didn't I get uh, the little the crib sheets to play this? Um, if you find all of the characters, there is a prize on the way home, OK, later on, OK? So keep your eyes out for these throughout the lecture. Um, I don't want to go anywhere with this without introducing you to these people here. Um, the reality is, and I'm looking at lots of the other academics uh, in the room, I'm sure you'll agree with me that one of the greatest privileges of working in academia is getting to spend time with some absolutely brilliant people. Uh, these are all of the PhD students and postdocs that I've had the privilege to supervise uh, over almost 20 years now. And the truth is, any form of success that we might be attributing to me this afternoon in reality is down to this lot here. So a massive thank you to all of you. Um, our Dean uh, for Science and Engineering refers to our PhD students as the kind of the powerhouse of our research. And this for me is certainly where the magic happens. So a big thank you uh, from me. Um, this is what I'm gonna try and cover in the next kind of 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, I'm very aware that not everybody here is an engineer, not everybody here is a scientist. So we're going to do a little bit of, there's going to be a bit of teaching at the start. Okay, so this first bit here, the kind of what is aerodynamics, what is CFD, what is optimization. Hopefully we're all going to learn something together and kind of agree on some kind of common language and some terminology, um, which will lead us into the second bit, which is kind of the researchy bit. Okay, so this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of, a lot of this research is collaborative. So I'm going to be talking about lots of people, many of whom are in this room. Um, on some of the, the kind of the developmental work that we've done. And then I'll move on to the kind of the third thing that we as academics do, which is take our research into the world and apply it to real world problems, the impact, the engagement with industry. So I'm going to talk about fast cars, space planes, and hopefully some other cool stuff. And depending on how much waffling and how many anecdotes I tell, there may or may not be time for me to reflect a little bit on what the future looks like. So in the title of the lecture, um, I, ref I refer to myself as an aerodynamicist. This is supposed to be reflections from an aerodynamicist. So it's probably useful for us all to agree, agree on what this term aerodynamics means, okay? So essentially, air, this fluid that surrounds us all right now, uh, can flow, okay? And as it flows over objects, whether they're cars or aeroplanes or trains or buses, that air interacts with the object, okay? And aerodynamics is the study of how air as a fluid interacts with the objects that it's flowing over. The key thing we tend to be interested in as aerodynamicists are what are the forces that that airflow imposes upon the object that it's flowing over. So in the, in the context of an aircraft, how much lift does it generate? How much drag does it generate? So that's what aerodynamics is. You're going to hear me talking about this thing called Mach number throughout this talk. Often as, as aerodynamicists, we need to categorize the flow. We need to we need to understand what type of aerodynamic phenomena are likely to appear in the flow fields that we're studying or modeling. And we often do this using one of a bunch of numbers. The, the important one for today is Mach number. So let's just by show of hands, how many of you came to this lecture theater today or to the university in a car? Put your hands up if you came in a car. That's a lot of you. How many of you, did any of you come by bus? There's a few of you, well done. Did anybody cycle? Well done. Those of you on the live stream, you probably just walk to your computer, right? Um, but I think it's a safe bet that however you came here today, you came on a subsonic mode of transport. You were traveling slower than the speed of sound. So the speed of sound on a day like today in Swansea is probably about 750 miles an hour. So as I'm talking to you, the sound is leaving my mouth and it's traveling across the lecture theater and it's traveling at about 750 miles an hour. If you're an object traveling slower than that, you're subsonic, you're down here, okay? If you're traveling faster than that sound can travel, you're supersonic, you're up here. But the really tricky bit, if we're honest, is this bit in the middle. There's this kind of slightly hand wavy, difficult to define region that we call the transonic regime. And a lot of the work that I've done has been based on trying to understand what shape something should be to traverse through this regime here, the transonic regime. <coughs> We're where we're fast enough for some weird stuff to start happening, things like shock waves, but we're not fully supersonic yet. Beyond all of this, there's this thing called hypersonics. We might touch on that a little bit later on, but that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of this. So when I talk about the Mach number, if the Mach number is one, that means we're at the speed of sound. If the Mach number is less than one, we're subsonic or transonic. If it's greater than one, we're supersonic. 
Now, why does any of this stuff matter? Well, it's because certain features in aerodynamic flows only appear at certain Mach numbers. Okay, so once we're into the transonic and certainly supersonic regimes, we have a problem. Now, as you all drove here today, or lots of you drove here, down Fabian Way, what was happening was your bicycle or your car or your bus was pushing up on the air in front of it, creating pressure waves or sound waves. And sound waves travel at the speed of? Well done. And the speed of sound is around about? 340-ish meters per second, 750-ish miles per hour. It depends on the temperature, okay? But basically, what those waves are doing, they're warning the air ahead of you you're coming. So the air ahead of you gets this little bit of advance notice that you're coming. It can start moving out of the way, the way, creating the space that you need to pass through. Once you're traveling at or faster than those waves can travel, the air doesn't get any prior knowledge that you're coming. And what happens is, instead, the air has to instantaneously react to your presence through something called a shock wave. Now, I grew up uh, in Limeslade. That's where our first house was growing up. And, and on that little bit of coast down there, Bracelet Bay, at the same time every evening, you could hear a shock wave. It was the same time every evening because it was the flight of Concorde. It was the London Heathrow to New York Concorde flight that was allowed to accelerate to supersonic speeds over the Bristol Channel. It wasn't allowed to fly supersonic over England, but let's not get into the politics <laughs> of that. So these things are real. And if we're studying something that's transonic or supersonic, um, we need to understand what they are and how they behave. Now, historically, an aerodynamicist would have spent a lot of time in one of these, in a wind tunnel, okay? The bottom three pictures here are the wind tunnels that we've got here on the Bay Campus. Um, and I've promised a few of you tours of the campus later, and we'll get to see these things. But over the last couple of decades, in the aerospace industry, definitely in Formula One, we shifted away from using wind tunnels as our primary tool for design. So if we're at the point where we're trying to figure out how do we improve the design of this car or this aeroplane, to computer modeling. And th this is where I'd like to introduce the first person who's been an important part of the reason that I'm here. This is Professor Oleg Zinkevich. Um, he gives his name to the institute, the research institute that um, I'm and many of the staff here are a part of, the Zinkevich Institute for Data, AI, and Modeling. And to many people, they would argue that, that Oleg is one of the grandfathers of, of a method that we make use of called the finite element method. I came here, um, I'll tell a few stories as we go along, and that might dictate how long this lecture goes on for. I ended up here um, in 2004, almost by accident, if I'm honest. Um, and this, for those of you, by the way, who are thinking about going into research and thinking about maybe doing a PhD, this is really bad advice, okay? Um, I, in 2004, was just wrapping up my degree in aerospace engineering, didn't know what to do next, but what I did know was I wanted to live in Swansea, okay? I grew up in Swansea, never for one minute did I think this is where I would like to settle down long term, but it doesn't take much time outside of Swansea to realize that Swansea is a pretty cool place to live. So I'd kind of assumed that I was going to become a school teacher, right? I'm, my parents were school teachers, I've married into a family of school teachers, and I just assumed that's where I was going. But somebody in the pub one night said to me, why don't you go to the university? They've got an engineering department. And I rocked up here, and this is a very bad approach to getting a PhD, I would suggest and turned up at a building that said engineering on it and walked into reception and introduced myself. And it just so happened that Professor Nigel Wetherill, who many of us will know was the head of engineering at the time, walked into the reception at that time and overheard the conversation. And he basically grabbed hold of me, took me to his office and offered me a cup of coffee, introduced me to Ken and Obey and said, would you like to do a PhD? I didn't really know what a PhD was and I agreed to it. Um, so that's how I ended up here. And towards the tail end of my PhD, I spent quite a bit of time with Oleg because towards the end of his life, he was still bright as a button, um, but his eyesight was failing. And every Friday, I would go over to his house in Mumbles and read his correspondence to him. So all his letters that he was getting through the post, I would read to him. And then we'd have a chat about the relative merits of discontinuous methods and high order methods and mesh refinement. And so a lot of my training, obviously it came from my PhD supervisor as well, but was just from sitting with Oleg towards the end of his life in his home in Mumbles. So what is computer modeling? What is computer simulation? Well, essentially, it's, it's where you use a computer to figure out how something in the real world works. And, and any type of computer model essentially goes through these steps. We ask ourselves, do we understand the physics of this problem well enough to describe the physics in the language of mathematics? Okay? If we can describe it in the language of maths, we then have a mathematical model. Okay? Now, usually, for the kind of problems that pop up in engineering, 
those equations are differential equations. They're quite difficult to solve by hand, if not impossible. So we say, well, how do we make our lives easier? Can we find some sort of way of approximating those equations in such a way that lends them to being solved by computers? We outsource the problem to a computer. It spits out a bunch of results. And then our job, or my job as an aerodynamicist, is to analyze the data that comes out of those simulations. And the subset of computer modeling where we're specifically interested in aerodynamic flows is known as computational fluid dynamics, or CFD. That's what we're talking about whenever I refer to CFD. Now, I'm going to be a little bit ambitious here. So I'm going to attempt to teach you the basics of CFD in about two or three minutes. Okay? Now, normally, we would spend an entire university semester teaching the basic principles of CFD. Okay? Um, quite frankly, we need the tuition fees. Um, but I'm going to do that in two or three minutes. Okay? What I'd like you to do is put up your hand if you think you could solve this equation here. So four times u is equal to 12. So u is some unknown. Just keep your hands in the air. I'm not going to ask anybody for the answer. The answer is three, by the way. OK? <laughs> um, so most of you in this room, like if you're past year eight, year nine in school, the chances are, in fact, probably before that, if you're past year eight and nine, you could probably do this. Keep your hand in there if you think you could solve these equations. So this is now simultaneous equation. Some of you are looking panicked. This is like flashbacks to maths lessons in school. Um, so we've got two unknowns, u and v. A bit concerned that some of the professors in my department do not have their hands up at this point. <laughs> what about if we extend this to three variables? So we've now got u, v, and w. Now this is normally for a general audience where I start seeing hands going down and faces looking a bit more concerned. But there's a sufficient, a reassuringly sufficient number of people thinking you could do this. U, V, W, and P, we've got four unknowns now. Now, I mean, so we could use a bit of kind of algebraic gymnastics. We could use something a little bit more sophisticated like matrix methods. But you get the principle, right? As we're increasing the number of unknowns in our problem, the number of independent equations that we need to solve goes up, OK? The problem is, and I'm aware that there are aerodynamicists in the room, and there are CFD experts in this room, and I recognize that what I'm doing here is massively simplifying the problem for the purposes of the lecture. But in in essence, we have five coupled unknowns in aerodynamics, or compressible aerodynamics, where density, okay, this property that air has, has, is a variable. If we have five unknowns, how many equations do we need? Five. Five equations. The problem is, those five equations look like this. Whoa. Yes, whoa, is the correct response to seeing these <laughs> equations. I first encountered the Navier-Stokes equations probably when I was 19 or 20, that sort of age, at university. And I feel like they've kind of haunted me ever since. Um, I've made some approximations to simplify them to fit on a slide here. Um, but if you look at that and you think that looks like an absolute nightmare, Ben, well, you're right. These are very difficult equations. They're not these simple linear equations that I was showing you on the last slide. They're nonlinear differential equations. OK, there's a couple of you about to start further maths. That will start to mean a little bit more to you uh, as you study further maths. But they're just simultaneous equations, OK? We've got a bunch of variables here. Rho, for example, is density. U, V, and W are the three components of the velocity of the air, because the last time I checked, we lived in a 3D world. But they come from pretty simple principles, OK? That first one is a statement of conservation of mass. These three here are statements of conservation of momentum. And we can probably guess what the third one is, conservation of energy, energy OK? And what we're essentially doing in the world of CFD is solving these coupled equations. And we're using a computer to do it. I don't have time today to go into the details of how we do that. Um, but there's a whole process that you have to go through. And the, the really expensive bit, as in the bit that requires a lot of compute time, is this bit here, where we give the geometry of the problem in a format that a computer can understand to a CFD solver. Okay? And so a lot of the work that I've been doing requires us to use high-performance computers, supercomputers. And we work very closely with supercomputing whales uh, to allow us to do this work. And this is basically the flow of the process that I've been on to do things like design the Bloodhound Land Speed Record Car and some of the other projects that I'll introduce you to later on. Now, I think most scientists and engineers, when they've kind of finished doing the work, what they really want to see are some pretty pictures, right? Um, so this is the kind of thing that CFD can throw back at you once you've got that data and turned it into a format that we can understand. So I'm coloring um, a set of simulations uh, of the Bloodhound vehicle here with pressure. Okay? Pressure is 
one of these important variables that dictates then forces. And what we spent a lot of time doing on the Blood Hand Project is looking at these sorts of images and trying to figure out, well, if that's where we're getting pressure buildups, how do we need to change the shape of the vehicle to keep it on the ground? Or how do we need to change the shape of the vehicle to reduce the drag? Which leads us on to this question of design and optimization. Okay, so what's the, this is another word that I'm going to be using a lot throughout the rest of this afternoon's talk. Well, the, the Cambridge English Dictionary defines it as this. I like this. It's just the act of making something as good as possible, right? Um, I think that's why I, I like being an engineer, right? That's kind of what I'm into, right? I enjoy taking problems and saying, how can we improve this? How can we make the world a better place for us all to live in? So let me give you the essence of how this works in a quite simple example, okay? So if we've got a, an aircraft here, and we want to design the wings for this aircraft, okay? And we're, we're asking ourselves the question, what shape should those wings be to, for example, maximize lift, okay? Classic problem for an aerodynamicist. And we've only got two variables to play with in this problem, okay? We're making it really simple. We're saying we can vary the wing span, or we could vary the wing area, okay? They're two independent variables. Um, we'll call them phi one and phi two to generalize this a little bit. So let's imagine on the x-axis here, we've got wing span, on the y-axis here, we've got wing area. Well, the first thing we need to do is say, well, what are going to be the maximum and minimum limits of these variables? Okay. Once we've done that, we've now defined what a designer refers to as, as the design space for the problem. Okay. We're saying somewhere in here, there's a combination of phi 1 wingspan, phi 2 wing area that gives us an aircraft with maximum lift. The question then is, where in that square? Okay. Well. There are lots of ways of solving this. One of the simple ways of doing this, okay, and this is used day in, day out in industry for solving this sort of problem, is say, well, let's sample this space. Okay? In the context of the work that I do, that would mean running a whole bunch of CFD simulations at these positions within the design space and get some data relating to the lift that's being generated by each of these designs. And then we say, can we fit some function? Is there some mathematical function that we can fit to this data and if there is, then in principle, we can interpolate between those points and find a position in this design space where the lift is being maximized, up here, for example. Okay? Now, the kind of tools that historically we've used to solve this problem have some drawbacks. One of them is that it might get stuck. Okay? So an optimizer might think this point here is the point of maximum lift simply because it hasn't explored this position over here. So how do we avoid that? So a lot of the work that I've been doing, and a load of this work has been working with Sean Walton, who sat right there, a colleague of mine in computer science, is we've been thinking about, well, this question. I mean, why should I, as a design engineer, be interested in Charles Darwin and evolution? Well, I would say the answer to that is because the most beautiful, elegant thing that has ever been designed is you. I'm looking at you particularly, Ashley. <laughs> of course, the, uh, Charles Darwin explained to us how this worked through the process of natural selection and survival of the fittest, leading us to, as we all know, Paw Patrol's rider as the <laughs> ultimate expression of the perfect human. So the question we've been asking ourselves is, can we steal some of these ideas, the principles of evolution, and put them into computer algorithms to help us design things? And one of the particular algorithms that I've worked a lot with and kind of, you know, I've collaborated with Sean in is what's called Cuckoo Search. You're going to come and join the lecture. This is my littlest one, by the way, <laughs> Johan. Um, so there's an algorithm. Again, we don't have the time in this lecture to go into the details of how it works, but it bases itself on the principles of the breeding behavior of the cuckoo bird. Okay? Um, Dr. Walton and colleagues came along and improved this algorithm, and improved it and gave it a new name called Modified Cuckoo Search. And this is an algorithm that I've used an awful lot of throughout my work over the last few years. A lot of my research has basically been taking some of these ideas in EA and figuring out how we couple them to CFD processes in an elegant way that allows us to solve real world problems. So how does it work? What are the principles of these evolutionary algorithms? Well, this is now, uh, imagine this is our design space, okay? We don't know how big it is. So somewhere in this space, we're, we're gonna find a design. Let's imagine it's that problem before of what's the optimum combination of wing span and wing area. The first thing we do in MCS is we say, well, which are the best designs? We can rank them, okay? These are the best three designs, for example, in this space where we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven designs. Now, we, we recognize they're good designs, so we're gonna hold on to them, okay? The other ones, 
we're basically going to discard. We're going to say, well, you weren't as good as those top three designs. We're going to throw you away. It's pretty aggressive, this algorithm. Okay, you're throwing away anything that's bad, regenerating some new designs somewhere else in the design space. And then the really clever bit then is you say, well, if those designs are good designs, is there something about them that we can learn from to give us new designs? Can we interbreed them? Can we take two designs and create an offspring that maybe is even better than its parents? Okay. If it turns out that the offspring are better than at least one of the other designs, we keep hold of it. If not, we throw it away. It's pretty brutal. But the reality is evolution is pretty brutal. And then we get to this point where we, we repeat the process. Okay. So we have a new set of designs. We go back to the start and we go, oh, okay, so now these three are our top eggs and we repeat the process. And one of the beauties of this is it allows you to explore the design space globally. You never get stuck in a rut somewhere like the kind of older gradient-based conventional methods uh, did. The problem with it is it's very expensive, which is, which is a big problem, but we probably haven't got time to go into that today. Now, I want to show you this example. I've got, I've, so I think the student who did this work is online. And I'm just going to pause this here. So this, this video shows probably the first time I kind of jumped for joy when we got a result out of all of this work. Because it, it was the first example I thought, we are doing some really cool stuff here that I'm not sure anybody else at that time was doing. So this is a problem, um, and it's a particularly tricky problem in aerodynamics. It's the inverse design of a transonic aerofoil. So the problem we're trying to solve here is, can our optimizer give us an airfoil shape. We know this, we, we know what pressure distribution we want around this airfoil. Okay? And we know ourselves running the algorithm, a priori, what shape this airfoil should be to give us that pressure distribution. But can the algorithm figure it out for itself? Okay? So we give it some arbitrary shaped airfoil. So we give it this starting shape, the black line here. Okay, it's just a symmetric NACA 0012 airfoil. We know the solution is this blue one. The algorithm doesn't know. Okay? And we know what the pressure distribution over this blue shape is. And what we said to the algorithm is, try and get that pressure distribution, which is kind of what we're seeing in these curves here, as close to that target as you possibly can by evolving the shape. Try stuff out, OK? And this is running that MCS Cuckoo Search algorithm. Let me go back, and I'm going to show you the video. So David uh, Nauman uh, is the student who did a lot of this work. He's now um, doing wonderful things at Airbus in Germany. Um, finished his PhD quite a few years ago now. And what we're seeing here is at each generation of the run, the fitness of the design, how far away that current design is from what we actually want, to the point where if we get it to zero, we've absolutely nailed it. Okay? And it runs for several generations. At each generation, we're actually running about 50 or so CFD simulations. So this is expensive, right? Now, there are techniques that we can exploit to speed this whole process up. But this is the first time we saw something that's actually really hard to do working. Um, and the code that we use to do this is available. You can download it, uh, email me, because it won't run when you try and run it, almost certainly. But uh, uh, yeah, you can access the code we use to do this. Which does beg that question. And it's a question I was, as part of our research week on Monday night, um, I was on a panel and we were all asked the question, what is AI, right? So what is artificial intelligence? And um, the reality is I know there are some computer scientists here who will probably uh, argue with me a lot when I give my definition of what AI is. One of the panelists on Monday night said, I don't think we should ever use the phrase AI because I don't think AI really exists. We all use it now, partly because it's out there in the world and people are using it, also because it seems to be useful for getting grants. Um, my definition of AI is if the algorithm that's running, in some sense, and here comes the vagueness of my definition, is learning as it runs, I'd call that AI. Sean has another slightly different. I, I'll, I'll let you tell people afterwards what your definition of AI is. Um, and I think this has got some of those elements, right? So in a, you can sense as you're watching what the algorithm is doing. It's testing things out. It's learning. It's going, okay, that's good. That's bad. What should I do next? In that sense, evolutionary computing is a form of AI. The question is, and well, if I get to the future slides, how do we exploit AI in a meaningful, ethical, moral, sensible way? That's the, that's the big question of where we're going. So the final thing I want to explore in this lecture is, well, what difference does any of this make? Okay, so what real world problems can you throw these ideas at 
and you know have impact well the obvious one for me and i guess for many people this is the project that i'm most associated with um i should tell you about that as well really so in 2007 it's bonkers really that it was that long ago do you remember the heady days of a labor government um shouldn't get into this should i um i was coming to the end of my phd and still kind of thinking if i'm honest probably the obvious next step is to do a pgc and become a school teacher and um just at the point where I was kind of wrapping up my PhD, I think Ube or Ken, I can't remember, called me in to say, this chap called Richard Noble has been to see us, and he wants us to help him design a 1,000 mile per hour car. We've been involved in the Thrust SSC project uh, back in the 90s, and he's come back, we're gonna, we're gonna try and do this again. Are you interested? And I hadn't been planning to stay in academia, is the honest truth. Um, it was one of the options, but I, I was thinking probably teaching is a better fit for me. Um, but this seemed like quite an interesting project to get involved in. And I was told this is going to be two or three years. And I was like, okay, I can delay getting into teaching for two or three years. That's fine. Well, here we are 20 years on and we're still plugging away at it. But we've thrown a lot of these ideas at this project. Okay? Some of the design of Bloodhound was that old school, let's just look at some PowerPoint slides. Let's sit down around a table. Let's try and figure it out using human intelligence, what we should do next in terms of the design process. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh. It's all right, it's gonna be okay. We get to hang out later, okay? Um, <laughs> but it's been a great test bed for throwing lots of these ideas at. So entire kind of aspects of the car have been designed using these optimization methods. Some very bespoke bits like the, the shape of the rear wheel fairing has been designed using these optimization tools. And I'm cutting a massive bit out of the story here. I know lots of you will have been following the progress of Bloodhound. Uh, but in 2019, we got to the point where we'd actually finished the design. In fact, we finished that in about 2015. We managed to get the car built and out to South Africa. And we started testing it. Now, this was, this was pretty nerve-wracking stuff. Jack, who's over, the, over there, he's one of my uh, NGD students and, uh, and then joined us as an RA to work on this project. Um, we flew out to South Africa and spent a few weeks basically in a porter cabin by the side of it. It, it makes it look very glamorous here, but a lot of our time was spent in a porter cabin in front of a laptop. And every time Bloodhound ran, we would download data from the car from about 150 sensors over the surface of the vehicle, measuring pressure, and from sensors on each of the wheels, measuring the reaction loads at the wheels, and comparing that data with the CFD models we'd used to design it in the first place. So I'd spent a decade basically telling the rest of the engineers, this is how we think the aerodynamics is gonna perform. It is gonna stay on the ground, trust me, it'll be okay. And then we went to South Africa to see if that was actually true. And it was a massive relief to Jack, but I think possibly even more to me, uh, that, that as the data started trickling in, that alignment between what we were seeing from the sensors and what we had told them the car would do was fantastic. Not perfect, but very good. And this is one of the key ones, Jack will remember this, we refer to this affectionately as the camel hump. So the CFD had predicted that as the car accelerated, so in this run, we took the car to 628 miles per hour. That's quite fast when you're stood alongside it, trust me. And uh, the CFD had predicted that as you accelerated through a certain speed, around about Mach 0.7, so it's doing about 550, 600 miles an hour at this point, up until that point, the downforce on the rear wheels would be constantly increasing. And then because of the formation of a shock system, that downforce would drop off. And that's exactly what we saw in the measurements on those rear wheels. And it, that was the time where I said to Andy Green, the driver, I think we've nailed it, Andy. Like, I think the CFD is doing exactly what we, you know, the car's doing exactly what we, the, we said the CFD, the CFD was saying it should do. Let's keep going, let's keep going. We took the car to 628 miles an hour. We didn't want to go any faster than that. That was enough. We had enough data to come back. We kind of proved the basic principles of, of the, the behavior of the car. The plan was to go back in 2020 and break a record. Well, we all know what happened in 2020. Um, so... That's where the project has got to. We'll see where it goes from here. The other thing that we were doing was plugging all of our CFD data into the overall performance model for the vehicle to predict things like, well, how long do you need to burn that jet engine for to get to a certain speed? And how far will the car have traveled when it gets to that speed? And uh, again, you can see we did it pretty well. Okay, so our model is the, the red curve here. This is what the computer predicted for a 628 mile an hour run we would need to do. Blue is what the car actually did. Okay. In fact, while it was accelerating, almost spot on is the truth. Okay. 
deceleration, they are, they're offset a little bit, and we know why that is. That's to do with the way the engine throttles down, and it didn't, the, the thrust didn't drop off quite as quickly as the computer model predicted, and so on. Towards the end of the Bloodhound project, um, I started thinking to myself, I mean, by this point, I'm basically trapped in academia. I kind of de-skilled myself. So I'm not sure I could ever transition into schools uh, at this point. I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, Bloodhound isn't going to run forever. I've been working on, I mean, arguably, the most interesting, ambitious, exciting aerodynamic design project happening in the UK. Where do we go next? Um, and this is where one of, um, I had a conversation with one of my undergraduate students um, called Becky Durrant, um, who I think might be watching online. Um, and she came up to me, and she was a third-year student, came up to me in a lab and said, um, have you heard of this project here? There's a company called Reaction Engines doing some really cool stuff. And I had heard of them. In fact, I'd had a few conversations with them through kind of Bloodhound links. And I'd already kind of set them up in my mind as I'd love to work with these people. They're trying to do something incredibly ambitious for an aerodynamicist, very exciting to work on. They, they're the obvious next thing to be kind of throwing these ideas at. So if you've not heard of them, um, they've been around for quite a long time. Um, they're a company based just outside of Oxford. Um, and they're developing, well, what they've been working on up until now primarily are the engine systems, these hybrid jet rocket engine systems um, that could, in principle, propel a single stage to orbit, horizontal takeoff space plane, all the way into space. Okay, So this vehicle, Skylon, in principle, will be able to take off from somewhere like Heathrow, go into low Earth orbit, do half an orbit around the Earth, and then land in New Zealand about three and a half hours later. Okay? It, in principle, we'll be able to take payload to the space station, astronauts uh, to the space station, and so on. But from a performance point of view, it turned out that the big problem they had was not to do with the kind of high, kind of hypersonic end of what this does. It was that bit in the middle, the transonics. How do they get the drag down around about Mach 1, 1.1, 1.2? And they threw this problem at us. And I, over the last few years, been working with Ben Smith, who is sat here as a PhD student. He's about to finish. You are going to submit your thesis soon, aren't you? You've committed in this lecture now. So it's, uh, um, and we've been throwing some kind of quite novel tools for parameterizing CFD models um, at this specific problem and, and employing what are called Bayesian methods, where you kind of take out some of the disadvantage of evolutionary computing, which is high computational cost, and take into account things like um, error distributions and so on. And we've managed, now this might not sound a lot, but over three years we've managed to knock about, how, what percent off the drag of the vehicle? About 2% off the drag of the vehicle. Now some of you are thinking, what, in three years that's all you've achieved. But that's actually massive in the context of aerospace. If we could say to Airbus, we'll knock 2% off the drag of an A380, well we would be very rich very quickly. But, um, so, so that's what we've been working on, throwing uh, these ideas at this problem here. And in fact there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that we've been doing over the last few years. And so I've been working with a company called Faraday, trying to figure out what the kind of stagger of their triple box uh, plane should look like. So you never know, we might be flying around on an aircraft that looks like this uh, in the next few years. And we've been working with Jacob, who's here somewhere, I can't spot him, there he is, um, looking at winglets, those weird little things that sit on the end of wings when you go on an aircraft, that they're there to try and reduce the induced drag, the, the drag that, that is there because of the downwash behind the wings. Um, looking at things like ducted winglets, okay, what shape should these things be to try and minimize these wingtip vortex and downwash effects? And it turns out you can also apply this to wind turbines. So this is the kind of the latest work that Jacob has been doing has been in this area. Um, something right uh, more down to earth that we'll see every day, right? So lorries driving down motorways. It turns out a huge amount of the drag on a lorry on a motorway is this at the base, base drag, wake drag, pulling it backwards. This massive, complex, unsteady, horrible, uh, wake. There's a company we're working with at the moment who are designing kind of retrofit panels that you could fit onto the back of a conventional truck um, to, to reduce the wake. And we've shown that this works. We've, we've helped them optimize these panels. We've even put the truck into the wind tunnel. If you wander down towards the wind tunnel later on, you can see this model there uh, in the wind tunnel lab. And this is one of my favorite projects because this connects me back into what I was doing as a PhD student, which I kind of haven't spoken a lot about. So. Um, we, I showed you the Navier-Stokes equations earlier, but there are some other equations that we can use. And particularly for high-speed, low-density problems, there's an equation called the Boltzmann equation, which is what I and uh, Ken and Obey's supervision developed a, a CFD solver for 15-odd years ago. And in this work here, we, we asked ourselves the problem, if we couple these methods to a different solver, which solves the Boltzmann equation for hypersonic, rarefied gas flows, can we figure out what shape a reentry vehicle should be? Okay. 
What shape should it be if we're trying to minimize thermal effects to, because of maximum temperature on the surface? What shape should it be if we're trying to minimize drag or maximize drag? So this uh, has been some quite exciting work that we've been doing. Again, a lot of this with Sean over the last few years. In fact, we've thrown these methods at all sorts of problems now. In hydrodynamics, in vertical axis wind turbines, cycling helmets. And in fact, how many of you remember the 1970s Bond bug? So you can go out now and buy an electric version of the 1970s Bond bug that was designed by us because they needed to get the, they needed to drop about 10% off the drag of the original version to, to have like a feasible electric solution. So we helped them do that and you can now go and buy that car. It costs a lot of money though, unfortunately. So, yeah, we're just, we're just about in time. So just a few comments on kind of where all of this is going. Um, what, what's the future gonna look like? And particularly the future in the context of exploiting AI. So if you go into industry today, there are kind of, there are still two camps in the like, how do we design things uh, question. There are a lot of en engineers, quite reasonably, still heavily reliant on just human intelligence, okay? And we did a lot of this on Bloodhound. We'd sit together, a group of us around a table, look at PowerPoint slides and go, well, I think we maybe need to do a bit of this or a bit of that. And it's all driven by the human. There's another camp increasingly in industry, but massively in academia, saying, why not outsource that problem to a computer? Why not use artificial intelligence to help you design something? And I think the future needs to be a combination of those two things. So the question that we're asking ourselves, and is driving a lot of the kind of the research we're doing now, is how do we incorporate real human intelligence into an otherwise AI-driven process? So part of that is how do you present data to a human engineer in a meaningful way. So we're, we've got projects just looking at how do we take all this big data from a CFD solver and throw it at a design engineer. If any, any of you have used things like Paraview or Insight to do CFD post-processing, right? You know what a faff that can be. So we've been working on, well, can we do that automatically? Can we throw that data at the design engineer much more quickly in a much more intuitive way to get them involved in this loop? And we've actually developed a whole bunch of tools that I'm going to give to you as a gift at the end of this, at the end of this lecture. The first one is called AeroDoodle. Um, so right now, you can go uh, through any old web browser and go to aerodoodle.swan.ac.uk and run your own CFD simulation. Okay? So we developed this as a project a few years ago, just for a bit of fun and as a bit of an outreach and educational tool. Um, and in here, you can draw a shape and, and watch in real time how the flow evolves around that shape but just in time for Christmas and Carlos is here, so I'm gonna put a lot of pressure on him because he's doing this work, okay? We're gonna give you the gift of Aerodoodle 3D, okay? Now this is a partnership project we've done with computer science who have some amazing augmented reality capabilities and we're gonna release for free, what a gift for your loved one for Christmas, for free on both the Android and Apple stores, this app which will allow you to run a real-time CFD simulation over any old object you've got in the house. You're just going to put, point your phone at it, identify the object, and it's going to run a CFD simulation for you. It is a bit of fun. It's, it's also something we think could be a really powerful educational tool. But increasingly, we're starting to think about, well, actually, this does start answering some of those questions about how does an engineer engage with these processes in a meaningful way? How do we engage a design engineer in an otherwise purely computational environment? I'm going to finish um, by saying a few thank yous. Um, a lot of what I've done in my career, particularly when I was sat down by Richard Noble and Andy Green and Ron Ayres and basically asked the question, what does a 1,000 mile per hour car look like? And I, you know, rabbit in the headlights. Um, but I must confess, the point in my career where I felt most out of my depth <laughs> was a couple of years ago when I was given the honor, and it has been a, a, an honor, to uh, head up the Department of Aerospace Engineering. Um, I know lots of my colleagues are here in the room. Um, and can I just say thank you, because you've made my job really easy, because you're brilliant. Um, when, when I was given this role, um, I didn't know what I was doing, let's be honest with you. Um, but you've made that job of kind of trying to steer good ship aerospace a really enjoyable one. I'm not going anywhere. This is not the end. Um, so, uh, so thank you very much to all of you. There are some very specific thank yous um, I would like to make. Um, first of all, Professor Ube Hassan and uh, Professor Ken Morgan. Uh, when I arrived here in 2004, I mean, I didn't have a clue really, did I? I mean, I didn't really know what a PhD was. Um, I certainly didn't really know what CFD was. And they very much took me under their wings and, um, and trained me. Um, and without them, I definitely wouldn't be here now. So a big thank you uh, to you two. I can hear some, if Jason Jones was here, 
he's saying you haven't learned an awful lot in, that, in those 20 years, Ben, because uh, Jason Jones is one of those people I'd also like to thank you. He's someone, I don't think he, I'm not sure if he is here. No, he's not. Um, Jason would be a rich man if he charged me a pound for every time I went to his office and said, last week my code was working, now it's not working, what have I done? <laughs> And he has quickly found the bug or the wrong input file or something that I'm using. Also, a big thank you to Sean. I often feel like I'm not entirely sure where I would be going research-wise if it wasn't for the collaborations that we work on. Um, he's been a fantastic person to work with, uh, very encouraging, and I hope we get to do lots more work together in the future. Uh, finally, well, I'll start with Hans Jens. Um, the truth is, if it wasn't for Hans, who kind of established aerospace at Swansea as a degree discipline, I would probably be right now teaching physics or something in a secondary school. So I really do need to thank him. <laughs> um, but he's been a massive supporter uh, of me and my career over the years. Um, and also to Antonio, um, as our head of school, I think he's one of the people who took a punt on me and offered me the head of department role a couple of years ago, um, and has created this amazing culture uh, in our school um, that it's a, a real privilege to be a part of. And the biggest thank you goes to this lot here. Um, less, less Jessie, <laughs> but I'll thank her as well. Um, thank you for putting up with me. Um, being an academic can be, I didn't expect to get emotional at this point. Um, Brené Brown would be proud of me, wouldn't she, Naomi? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for putting up with me. It's I know it's hard because I end up having to travel a lot. There have been a couple of days this week where I've left the house to catch a train before the kids are awake and not get back till after they've gone to bed. Um, Naomi is a superhero. She's doing a far more difficult job than I am, which is teaching in a secondary school whilst juggling me and three kids. Um, so, Diolchan Varo, thank you very much. And to all of you, thank you very much for coming. Diolchan Randa, Osna, Inru Question Nile, do my very best to answer your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>